Do you know what it is? It's a bird feeder. It's a very humble bird feeder. It's not fancy, but there's actually a reason that it's constructed that way. And that reason is that there are many little birds who struggle all winter long digging in the deep snow for seeds that have fallen from other bird feeders above because they don't like those little bird feeders. They're ground foraging birds. So they're just not comfortable on those little enclosed bird feeders that uh, songbirds like. So it's good to have in your collection of bird feeders a bird feeder like this. It's called a tray bird feeder. And you can see it's got um, a nice solid floor in it and drainage holes because when it rains the seeds will get soggy if there's nowhere for the water to go. And all you do is come out every day and throw some seeds in there and then the morning doves and the sparrows get to eat from a safe place instead of on the ground. Because you see, normally they rely on the kindness of strangers really because other birds kick seeds out of the feeders and then those other birds get to eat it off the ground. Well. Let's just keep them out of harm's way because cats will get them if they're having to eat off the ground. So what I have here is a 24 inch long, wow! <laughs> it's not exactly in the ground yet, but it'll be more solid. Okay, so th these boards are 24 inches long and they're uh, one by eight cedar or redwood if that's what you can get in your area. And the reason you use one of those two woods is because uh, they're very weather resistant. They'll last about, well, 20 years or so. And then the way this is constructed is <laughs> is that there's this um, this piece on the bottom that sort of straps the two floor pieces together. And then there's this flange that's made out of galvanized metal and a galvanized uh, steel pole. So it's not going to rust. OK, so <coughs> that's about the last time I'm getting that out of the thing. <laughs> OK, stay. All right, so also, People use these squirrel collars so squirrels can't get up into the feeders. They're designed after those old uh, rat funnels that you used to see tied up on ships in the olden days because they were keeping rats off the ropes. Well, I got a whole other idea for one of those that you're going to love. So um, I didn't think it up myself, but it's still a really cool idea. Well, it's probably cooler than anything I would have thought up, really. So um, this is the floor, like I was just saying. And then this will be the strapping piece. Now, th this is the easy part. We just build a platform, OK? Then we have to put a little fence around it. And normally, it's really hard to find cedar in this one by two width, because it, it tends to twist a lot. So we're just going to make our own. All right, so I'm going to line this up. And then this is just cut from a one by six that I had lying around. So I'll just more or less center it. And then I want to show you these zinc screws. These are um, outdoor screws. Sometimes outdoor screws are um, coated with um, a sort of a plastic coating that keeps them from rusting. Uh, but the zinc ones are great because they're kind of fast going in. Now, cedar splits really easily, so you want to countersink the screws. To do that, you use a countersink bit which carves out a, an extra little bit of a dent, a little depression, for the head of the screw so that it doesn't sink into the wood and then split it. Another thing, when you're cutting your wood for the first time, often you, um, you often find with cedar and redwood that it's split. So it's a good idea just to square off the board and start with a nice fresh cut because it just isn't going to do you any favors if the whole thing starts splitting apart as you're building it. OK, so I'll just show you what this uh, countersink bit does. <laughs> Two drills, no waiting. And uh, one other thing I want to show you is this is a finder driver bit. Look. Huh? You're going to be proud to have one of those, I'll tell you. Look what it does. You cover this screw up. This is to avoid having to hold the screw and then possibly poking your hand or losing your balance. All it does is it centers the screw for you. There. 
No splits, nice clean thing. All right, so another one. I'll just try to do that a little bit better. So you normally you're kind of balancing the screw like this and it's a bit tricky, so now. Hear that sound? Sounds terrible, but it's a good sound. That's just the clutch saying, I, I'm done here, meaning the screw is completely in the wood. Okay, so I'll finish um, adding the screws here and then we're ready to move on to the fence that we're gonna build around it. If a project is starting to falter because your hands just aren't doing what your mind envisioned, sometimes it's good to just bag it and go nuts. As the entertainer Danny Kay once said, life is a great big canvas and you should throw all the paint you can on it. Okay, now if you're the type of person who forgets to wear your safety glasses like I am, I've been known to tape them on my face so I don't keep forgetting, okay? So you might have to resort to that. Just don't use the high friction duct tape because then, you know, you have half an eyebrow missing and it just ruins the weekend, really. The bar scene isn't the same when you're sort of, never mind. But anyway, um, so the next thing to do is measure for the little fence that goes around the outside of the tray. And um, cedar and redwood, are they're, they tend to cup and twist a bit, so you definitely want to measure these things carefully. So I've got 14 and a half, and then of course 24. Now, one of these ends is going to be the long end, and one of them is going to be the short end. In other words, once these two pieces are in place, I have to cut a longer board to go on the end. So what I'll do first is I'm going to cut this board first, and actually I'm going to make it the short board. And now, okay, where I've lived, I can never find cedar one by twos. That's that size, this size. So we're gonna have to make our own. And normally you think, well, I don't have a table saw, so I can't rip down the lumber that I wanna use. I have to, I'm stuck with what they sell at the store. But you're not, okay? You, you can cut it yourself. And um, see, I've got this board set up. It's 24 inches long, which is the length that I need over there. And I'm gonna use this pull saw. Uh, it's a Japanese style saw, and the big teeth on this side are for ripping. That's what they're made for. Whereas these little teeth are for cross cutting, so I use them going across the grain. Um, to mark this one and a half inch piece that I need, there's a couple of ways to do that. Well, there's hundreds of ways, really. You can take a speed square, and they, they're, they're notched, so you can kind of dig a pencil in where you want it, and then just drag it along the board like this. Okay, the, the pencil's not actually making contact with the wood, so I, I might have known this would go badly. I was, I was thinking I'd be really slick on this. Every time I have one of those thoughts that contains a fair amount of hubris, I get in trouble. Okay, come on. Ah. Oh, this, this is funky, all right. But you know what? <laughs> it's just so bad. Okay, that's okay, though. I'll line, I've got a little bit of a line started here, so I'll just finish it off like this. Um, I'm such a fan of just eyeballing things because I like, I like stuff that looks handmade because it just has heart, you know? So I'm just gonna go with that line even though it's a bit strange. Where'd my saw go? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit off today, I must say. Off like a pound of Limburger. Okay, so I'm using the wrong side. I'm gonna use the big teeth to start it like this. You can just brace your finger against the side of the blade to get it started. And then off we go. Now, remember to keep blowing the sawdust away so you can see your line, what's left of it, the little vagrant line that you possibly do better than mine. And the great thing about ripping is there's quite a lot of the length of the wood, so that's always pleasant because what you do is, as you're working on it, you actually develop upper body strength. So 
well, at least tone. So switch hands every once in a while, and that'll develop you bilaterally. You know, the great thing about making stuff is that while you're working, you just don't have any problems. You're in that rarefied plane of contentment and ease. Of course, the danger is that you feel so good you don't notice that the thing you're making might be kind of goofy looking. No, you're speaking to your muse. Now, if only your muse would return the favor. Well, um, my strips are now cut for the little fin fence, and um, I actually moved over to using the circular saw in the end because we just didn't have that kind of time. I wasn't as fast as I expected to be, but I, I have room for improvement. I'm going to be quite beefed up by the end of making six of these, which is what I'm making for Christmas presents for people. Okay, so here's the deal. The little pieces line up now. You just want to check the fit to make sure it's okay. and. Um, Make sure that the boards are all cut to the right length. Dry fitting, it's called. Now, um, in your enthusiasm to complete your project, sometimes you might move ahead a little too quickly. Uh, I've been known to do that. And then you end up with a bird feeder that has a, it's upside down is what it is. So then you just have to forgive yourself and move on. And, it, and I would try to incorporate it if you can, because it makes it more interesting. However. I'm going to try to do it right, so flipping it over. Um, just you're going to need to support it. There, it's going to be like this. OK, now, again, countersinking is crucial because the wood will split on the ends if you don't. And you want to have this nice, clean effect, OK? Um, you want to drill, you want to attach the fence on the side, the long end, in three places into the side of the floor, OK? And then on the ends, you attach the fence to itself. So you always attach the fence to itself at the corners. You pin it together here and here. And then these two boards are supported right there and also here. So there's plenty of, this, this thing could probably hold, you know, 100 kilograms or a lot of weight is what I'm saying. OK, and I'm going to work on this corner first. Safety glasses. I'm drilling into a knot here, and that can be tricky. So keep your hand out of the way in case the drill skates. These finder drivers work really great with long screws. The short ones, are, it, it's a bit wasted, really, because I don't really have an aiming problem. At least that's what I've been told. OK, also watch it, because um, you saw what just sort of happened there. The, this board sort of started to flip up, because this is, of course, going in a clockwise direction. You can get conked on the head. All right. Great, so I'll just finish um, supporting the fence in all these special locations, and then we're ready to attach it to the pole. OK, my bird feeder's coming along nicely. Ooh, um, this is a drainage hole. It looks huge, but the seeds tend to get mushy and clump up. And they obscure these holes fairly readily. So I found that half an inch is actually a good size for a big tray feeder like this. Um, I just have to drill two more over on this side. And I've got a board underneath because I don't want to ruin the surface of my workbench. So um, if you're just using a cheap workbench, it's always nice to drill a hole in it somewhere for this sort of purpose so that you can put your work right over that, that hole, kind of like a two inch hole. Plus, it's fun to, to drill it using a hole saw. OK, one more, two more of these, I guess. The Chinese proverb says, with time and patience, the mulberry leaf becomes a silk gown. That's a lot of time in the silkworm's digestive tract, though. Talk about seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Whoa, <laughs> that was a live one. OK. 
There we go. See? Cool, eh? Okay, these tore out a little bit. That always happens. Um, now, the next stage is actually mounting the metal hardware onto the bottom of the feeding tray. So you can see over here, well, that it's this thing. This is the flange. And it's threaded on the inside so that we can um, screw the galvanized pipe into it. Now, it's time for that trick I was telling you about, the one that replaces the squirrel cone. And it is, it's this, the slinky. Remember these great old things? Remember spending hours with these things and doing the thing on the stairs? Well, think how much fun you, with your overdeveloped human brain, had with a slinky. Think how much fun a squirrel's going to have with one of these, OK? Squirrels love these for about one afternoon, because it impedes their progress up the pole. And they pretty soon give up on the whole idea of the seed factor at the top. But it is fun to watch the squirrels try to figure out one of these. And what happens is you actually just bend one open um, just at the top, slide it under two of the screw holes on the flange, and then tighten all the screws down. Then you slide the slinky back over the opening and screw in your pole. And then, well, then it's very dramatic when you stand it up in the slinky. Well, I'm saving that for later, because that's just a great moment. So for now, I'm just going to screw in the flange. And I'll start by centering it. Did I do that already? All right, and then I'm going to use the same um, zinc screws that I was using before. And I don't have to um, pre-drill this time, because I'm nowhere near the end of a board. You're only really worried about splitting when you're near the end of a board. Cue the sound of a huge crack forming in the wood. But no, I was, I was right on this one. OK. All right, then. So I'm going to get the pole. Try to put it up in the air about six feet, and that way the um, birds are safe from springy cats and other predators. And these galvanized pipes are available at hardware stores. Sometimes you have to ask them to thread them for you. OK, cool. Now, I have my beautiful feeder. I have the slinky effect. But my problem is that I have to pound this into the ground. And I don't want to wail with a sledgehammer on the top of my newly finished bird feeder. So I'll think that through, and then I'll come up with something. <laughs> OK, I figured out how to get my bird feeder into the ground. This is a shorter piece of galvanized pipe. And it's, uh, I live in a frosty area, so I'm going to drive it into the ground two feet so that it's really stable. But before I drive it into the ground, I'm going to put this little galvanized cap on, OK? And then once the cap is on it, you, you wail on it, really, with this, OK? You bang on it and bang on it, because you wouldn't want to do that without the cap on it, because you'd wreck the threads. Then once it's in the ground, and if you're in a frost-prone area, you'll want to drive it at least two feet into the ground so it's stable in the thaw and freeze cycles, you replace that cap with a coupling. And the coupling has threads at both ends. So the magic of that, of course, is that once this is on the piece that's embedded in the ground, you can then screw the bottom of your brand new bird feeder into that, and you're golden. OK, but if you want to make the humble bird feeder Clearly, you're equipped. If you want to do something a little fancier, look what this one is like. 
Is that not beautiful? Look, the spindles, the little cedar shingles. And this was made by Kevin Driver and Kathy Bridgewater of Omimi, Ontario. It's very beautifully made. And these are a little bit more rustic, but very sweet, all hand painted. And they are made by uh, Keith and Phyllis Longmire of Hillsborough, Nova Scotia. Aren't they gorgeous? Okay, now, if you're going to do the bird feeding thing, remember that the bigger birds in winter eat earlier and go to bed because they're bigger and fatter and their body weight can take them through the night. But the little birds come later and because they have to eat late, you should never let them go to bed hungry. So put some out late at, in like around four or five because they're the ones with the really skinny ankles and you don't want them to be cold. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, there are no days in life so memorable as those which vibrated to some stroke of the imagination. Even if your project doesn't turn out the way you imagined it, at least practice acting satisfied, because your hands are one step closer to being able to translate the glorious vision in your head. <laughs>